Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Jasper Bon on piano and Anke Kamphuis on violin. Thank you. It's very nice that we're here tonight in the Rode Hoots for another lecture of the John Adams Institute. It's a great honor to have Michael Cunningham again in our series. It was 13 years ago that he was in Amsterdam speaking for our audience. It was not at the Rode Hoot, it was a slightly smaller hall. I'm very happy that you're here in such great numbers because I think after that 13 years he has written not so many books, but I think he wrote the best book, and um, he's here tonight to talk about it. Um, before um, Michael will come up and speak about it, uh, Stine Jensu will introduce Michael, and Stine um, is a freelance writer for the NRC, and she just wrote a nice book on something completely different than we're going to talk about tonight, but it's um, worth reading. It's Dirks of Linders. It's just been published by Prometheus. Prometheus just made the translation of Specimen Days, Stralende Dagen, and I thank Prometheus and Van Dittmar for making this all possible. Um, tonight is a night uh, like any other John Adams night, so that means we don't have any intermission. After Michael's talk, Stina will go into the interview and you can ask questions too. You can use the mics on the aisles. And upstairs on the balcony, there's a microphone. Um, after the talk, Michael told me that he is willing to do a book signing, so I'm very happy about that. So you will have a chance to have your book signed. But before that, I will be back, and have, I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Stina. Good evening, everybody. It is said that if a novel is really good, you want to call the author right after reading it and let him or her know how you feel. Holden Caulfield, for instance, the teenage rebel from J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, likes reading classics. And he says, what really knocks me out is a book that, where you're all done reading it, you wish the author that wrote it was a terrific friend of yours, and you call him up on the phone whenever you felt like it. Holden wants to call Isaac Dinesen and Ring Lardner, but not Somerset Mom. He just isn't the kind of a guy I want to call up, he says. But Thomas Hardy, on the other hand, would be one of them. Each time I finished a Michael Cunningham book, I always felt like Holden Caulfield. I didn't want to phone Michael up, but I did, did, did feel a deep urge to call one of the characters from his books. A Home at the End of the World was about an intriguing love affair and friendship triangle between Bobby, Claire, and Jonathan. And I desperately wanted to call Claire and discuss with her whether she should have the baby or not, and by whom. <laughs> and after finishing Flesh and Blood, I wanted to phone the single mother Zoe, who had been diagnosed with AIDS, and tell her, given the difficult circumstances that she was in, I would be happy to babysit for her any time. And after reading the hours, I desperately wanted to send a text message to Laura Brown to let her know she should not feel guilty at leaving her husband and son and that her life had not been meaningless because her story had been beautifully recorded by Michael Cunningham in his book, The Hours. <laughs> this evening, it is my task to briefly introduce uh, to you Michael Cunningham. And I guess most of you present here tonight know a lot about him already because his star rose to Hollywood proportions when the film version of the Pooler Surprise winning novel The Hours came out. The novel The Hours is a tribute to Virginia Woolf's novel Mrs. Dalloway as well as a playful adaptation of it. Three stories of women are delicately interwoven. That of Virginia Woolf in the 1920s, the housewife Laura Brown in the 50s, and Clarissa Vaughan, a publisher in the late 20th century. In the film version, Virginia Woolf was played by the actress Nicole Kidman, wearing an incredibly convincing nose makeover. <laughs> what I liked about The Hours was its delicate prose, its sensitivities. It displays towards the others, especially in society, women and gay men, for instance. And it also poses a question 
I think every woman can relate to. Times have changed for the good, as women now have far greater choices they can make. Yet Virginia, Laura and Clarissa are all struggling to find happiness and they are rethinking the consequences of the choices they have made or didn't make. My all-time favorite quotes come from this novel and I think this should definitely be made in one of those tegeltjes wijsheden we have here in the Netherlands because it's so beautiful. It says, there's just this for consolation. An hour here or there when our lives seem, against all odds and expectations, to burst open and gives us, gives us everything we've always wanted. Still, we cherish the city, the morning, we hope more than anything for more. In this quotation, melancholy is combined with a deep psychological insight and the reader senses, senses an emotional truth about life. We are here today especially to talk about Cunningham's latest novel. It is called Specimen Days, Stralende Dagen in Dutch. And it alludes to the unfortunate events in New York on the 11th of September in 2001. Recently, we have seen a small tsunami of 9-11 novels, such as Saturday by Ian McEwan and Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by John Jonathan Severin Foer. But the difference between... Cunningham's novel and these is, I guess, as Cunningham puts it himself in the author's note, that Specimen Days is semi-accurate in the sense that Cunningham has taken the liberty as a novelist to freely juxtapose events, people, and buildings. If you think an author shouldn't use the same formula twice, Specimen Days forces one to reconsider that notion. Here, Cunningham does something apparently similar to what he did in The Hours. He tells us three stories, based on the literary genres such as the thriller and science fiction. And they're set in different times, and again there's a literary giant who spans the stories. It is this time the visionary poet Walt Whitman. The three stories are all set in New York, and all involve a group of a man, a woman, and a boy with names that are, that are variations on Lucas, Catherine, and Simon. There's one scene in this book that I particularly like. In the first story, we meet a young Irish boy called Lucas. He has lost his brother Simon and is trying to look after Simon's girlfriend Catherine. Lucas is a great admirer of Walt, Mid of Walt Whitman. At the end of the story, he accidentally runs into the great poet, or think he does and starts speaking to him by quoting his poetry. What follows is a wonderful conversation about the search for identity and place. What are you searching for, lad? Walt Whitman asked the young boy. He could not say money. Walt sends the kid up north, away from New York, to the edges of the city and beyond, where buildings thin out and the grass begins. It is a moving passage with again that combination of melancholy and lightness, earnestness and playfulness. And thinking of the cinematic power of it, I must admit I could not resist wondering who would play Walt Whitman on the screen. Ah, and yes, I also wanted to phone Lucas and tell him that yes, he should follow Walt's advice, go where the grass begins, and that no, he should not worry too much about love. Catherine is not the only woman in the world, and there are others who will love him. Let me pause here and give the floor to the one you came to listen to tonight, Michael Cunningham. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you for that um, incredibly lovely introduction. Oh, um... It always takes me a moment to adjust to the fact that I seem to be standing at a podium um, in front of other people. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Oh, oh, and by the way, um, Nicole Kidman has agreed to play Walt Whitman in the, in, in the film adaptation. We feel confident she's up to it. There's going to be a little more prosthetic work involved, but we, but we know she can do it. Thirteen years ago, I was here at the John Adams Institute talking about writing fiction during the AIDS epidemic. 
which is by no means over. Um, but 13 years later, we find ourselves in the middle of, oh, a global, a global crisis that is, if anything, more terrifying than, than the AIDS epidemic, the rise of terrorism. Um, I had the idea about specimen days that about the same time I thought about writing the hours. It was sort of like, will I write this one or will I write that one? And all I knew was that I wanted to write a book that started in the Industrial Revolution and sort of traced the arc of technology into the future, into a future of cloning and genetic engineering and interstellar travel. And I, I, I wrote the Virginia Woolf one first. And then, and then this one. I decided that the best way to tell the story was was going to was in three distinctly sort of contemporary and and off and and often oft considered sort of lesser forms: a ghost story, a thriller, and a science fiction story. Though they are they are not by any means lesser to me. I love I love those genres, and I I, I read in them all the time. By the time I started writing Specimen Days, however, 9-11 had occurred, and it didn't seem possible, it didn't seem conscionable to write a novel that didn't take 9-11 into account somehow. Since that time, so many things have happened to all of us, including the people of Amsterdam, the terrible murder not long ago. And I feel like what I'd like to do is read very briefly from Specimen Days. We are going to have a little conversation. And what I'm most eager to do is for us to talk to each other about the times we are, at least at the moment, surviving. I have no wisdom on the subject. It would feel ludicrous for me to stand up here and sort of carry on about global terrorism. Let's just, let's just, in a few minutes, let's just talk about it among ourselves. This is a short passage from the second, the middle section of Specimen Days called The Children's Crusade. Uh, <clears throat> Each of the stories does involve the same three characters, though they kind of morph from story to story. And in this one, the woman is a black forensic psychologist who is in charge of listening, take, taking uh, threatening phone calls that the, the police kind of patch over to those who supposedly know how to handle them. She'd missed it. Nobody blamed her, but she shouldn't have missed it. She was supposedly one of the magic few, one of the ones who could hear the ping of true intention, like a distant hammer driving home a nail, no matter how florid the caller, no matter how unlikely the threat. But she had missed it. When the call came, she thought, white kid, somewhere between an old 12 and a young 15, standard cyber geek sitting in a smelly boy room that no force on earth could make him clean, surrounded by big gulp cups and remote controls, pale, ferret-like underling who lacked inflection of voice or body, who looked grubby even on the rare occasions when he was clean, who had one or two friends exactly like him and spoke to no one else, just his family because it was unavoidable, and his tiny band of fellow Igors with whom he shared a private language and a vocabulary of creepy passions and a proclivity for spending as much time as humanly possible in dim suburban bedrooms that glowed with furtive computer light and smelled of feet and sweaty wool and old cum. This kid, in various incarnations, was a regular feature of the deterrence unit. They were a breed, sad little pockmarked desperados, half mad with hormones and loneliness, sitting out there with their dicks in one grimy hand and their cell phones in the other. Nothing about the call had been notably different. None of the danger signs was there, or so she thought. She only half remembered it at best. No specifics of target or weaponry, just that adolescent voiced vow to take out an average citizen, because people were, well, what's wrong with people? Tell me. Oh, fucking up the world, destroying it. 
You thinking of anyone in particular? Someone specific you want to take out? Well, it doesn't matter, does it? We're all the same. Not to us, we're not. I mean, it doesn't matter to the world. It doesn't matter in geological time. Who are you mad at? I think you're mad at someone, am I right? No, you don't get it. I'm not mad at anyone. I'm just going to blow somebody up, and I thought I should tell someone. Click. Cat had blue tagged it, sent it down the funnel. Then three days later, she'd heard that ping in the back of her mind when the report came in. Explosion on Broadway in Cortland, right by ground zero. At least one splattered, two likelies, maybe more. She had by then talked to dozens more potentials, among them a guy who said he was posing as a gay man and going to gay bars to slip poison into other men's drinks, thus helping to eliminate a few of the people who were sucking the sap from the tree of life. She talked to an elderly male Hispanic who was going to machete the staff of the public library, main branch, unless they tracked down whoever had been writing insults about him in the pages of the books. She'd started making lists again. She'd been trying to kick the habit. But after the man who was going to dice the librarians hung up, there it was, right in front of her, in Sharpie, on a post-it. Harm is in the books. Kill the harmless. New broom? That wasn't crazy. These were her notes. A psychologist took notes. Still, hers could run a little loose. She'd crumpled the post-it and thrown it away. Given the current climate, she didn't like the idea of somebody finding those particular words in her handwriting. And okay, she didn't like the fact that she hadn't fully realized she was doing it. When the news arrived, Kat heard the ping, but couldn't quite remember the call. It came to her with the particulars, which rolled in an hour plus after the incident. Two splatters, not just one. And barring further developments, it seemed that the, vapor that the vaporized one had been rigged with explosives. The other had been identified as Dick Hart, real estate developer, part of the World Trade Rebuild, whose third left-hand finger, wearing a wedding band, had been found on a walk-don't-walk walk box. Right. Going to blow somebody up. Thought I should tell you. Jesus. Cat retrieved her report, notified Pete Ashbury. If this kid was the one, she had missed it. She declined Pete's offer to go home early. She sat out the remainder of the day, waiting to hear whether they'd picked up any more fragments from the site. She talked to a man who was going to firebomb a Starbucks, no specifics of location, because they insisted on hiring nigger whores. She dutifully declined to mention the shade of her own skin but did put a hex on the fucker telepathically. She talked to another man, Slavic accent, who was going to kill the deputy mayor. Why the deputy mayor? Because as far as she could tell before he hung up, it just seemed like an interesting thing to do. She kept all her pens in her drawer off the desktop. It was a little like quitting smoking. Pete came to her cubicle at five minutes to five. He was as big as a file cabinet and about that exciting but he was a decent man. He wore his troubles bravely. His wife was going blind. His daughter had married some eco-cultist who dragged her to Costa Rica to live in a tree. Now what, Kat said. She was in no mood. Well, she should sweeten up. She had, after all, quite possibly missed it. But if she went all nice and apologetic now, if she started acting like someone who needed forgiveness, she might never get back to herself. Screw them if they wanted her meek. Pete stood in the opening. He couldn't call it a doorway. It was just the point at which Cat's four feet by five feet bled into the greater, greater fluorescence with his mouth settled. Pete was the only brother in deterrence. His skin was varnished mahogany, his hair an incongruously beautiful silver gray. When he was stern and focused, he could put a can under his upper lip and push his nose to start the opener function. We got a left forearm, he said. We got half a sneaker with half a foot inside. It's a kid. Jesus. You ready for this? Kid walked up to this guy, hugged him, and self-detonated. Hugged him? Witness says so. White kid wearing a baseball jacket. Very regular looking. This is from, one of our, from both our reliables. It's only the one who says he saw the clinch. Fuck me. Fuck everybody. Who does Dick Hart turn out to be, she asked. Speculator, not Don Trump, but big, one of the people who make the high-rises rise. Funny business? Nothing yet. Lived in Great Neck with wife number two. Some kids, some pets, you know. Think you knew the boy? Hope so. 
Everyone would hope so. Everyone would be saying a silent prayer right now to the effect that the kid had been Dick Hart's illegitimate son or that they'd been having sex in a park in Great Neck or whatever. Just don't let it be random. Shit. Pete said, we don't know it was your caller. I have a feeling, though. Yeah, well, I do, too. Want to hear the tape with me? Nothing would please me more. She went with Pete down the corridor to the audio room. Pete stopped en route in the lunchroom for a couple late-day bottom-of-the-pot coffee sludge with four equals. Cat graciously declined. She and Pete went to the audio room. <clears throat> they sat in the synthetic plush gray chairs. Aaron had cued the tape for them. Pete punched the button. Hello, this is Cat Martin. Like everybody, she hated hearing her own voice on tape. Inside her skull, it didn't sound so flat, so harsh. To herself, she sounded muscular and musical, smoky, a little like a young Nina Simone. Hello? There it was again, that throaty boy voice, utterly unexceptional. Nervous, a little squawky, probably 13. Are you a policewoman? And your name is? I called the police and they patched me over to you. What can I do for you? Nothing. You can't do anything for me. His poor mother must have been hearing those words ever since puberty turned her sweet little boy sullen and strange and fetid. Why are you calling then? I want to tell you something. What do you want to tell me? Silence. She could picture him all over again, desperate little wanker with a room full of slasher movie posters summoning his courage. Nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing at all. I'm going to blow somebody up. Who? I can't tell you. Why do you think you can't tell me? People have got to be stopped. Why do you think that? We've got to start over. You're thinking of stopping someone in particular? What well, doesn't matter who? It does matter. Why do you think it doesn't matter? I mean, it doesn't matter to the company. What company? The one we all work for. Who do you work for? You work for it too. Is the company telling you to hurt somebody? You think I'm crazy, don't you? I think you're angry. Please don't talk to me the way you talk to crazy people. I mean, one person doesn't matter. The numbers don't crunch in single digits. You want to hurt someone who's hurting you. Is that right? I can't talk to you. Yes, you can. Tell me your name. I'm in the family. We gave up our names. Everybody has a name. I just wanted someone to know. I thought it would be better. Better for who? I wasn't supposed to call. Shit, there it was. You can work this out without hurting anybody, she said. Tell me your name. I'm nobody. I'm already dead. Click. She had, in fact, messed up then. The moment a caller referred to anyone else, it was an automatic red tag. Any caller who claimed to be receiving instructions from a friend, from Jesus, from the dog next door, or the radio transmissions that came through the fillings in his teeth got promoted to the next level of seriousness. This one had been vague enough. He wasn't supposed to call anyone. But still, she should have kept him talking, shouldn't have pressed quite so hard for his name. Had she been making a list? Probably. Had she paid more attention to her list than she had to the caller? Hope not. I'm in the family, she said to Pete. Well, we gave up our names. What's that about? Your guess is as good as mine. Is there a rock band with lyrics like that? We're checking. Good. The family. What family? The Brady Bunch. The Mafia. IBM, you know. Right. She'd had one just the other day. Mild-voiced citizen who said he was going to start driving around the country and running down illegal immigrants under orders from Katie Couric. They tended to like the idea of working for celebrities or international corporations. I do, Kat said, I do know. Pete said, eh, I should have red-tagged it. He wasn't nasty about it. Simple statement of fact. These things happened. You checked the trace, she asked. Yeah, payphone, corner of Broad, a Bowery and 2nd Street. Ugh. Bound to happen sooner or later. He slurped his coffee. I didn't think it would happen to me. Go home. Tell your boyfriend to make you a drink and take you someplace nice for dinner. Think he was really as young as he sounded? Yeah, that I couldn't tell you. Wait for forensics. How would a kid get a bomb? Well, I'd say where they get all their deadly weapons. From his parents. Pete? Yeah? Nothing. I'll see you tomorrow.
She goes home, calls her boyfriend, and tells him he has to meet her, meet her for dinner because she's had a very bad day. <clears throat> she got to Le Blanc in exactly half an hour. She was the first to arrive, as she'd expected. Simon could never just put down the phone and walk away, not even in an emergency. He lived in an ongoing state of emergency. He traded futures. Yes, he had explained it all to her, and no, she still didn't understand what exactly it was that he did. Fortunes flicked across his computer screen, falling and rising and falling again. He was the man behind the curtain. If he failed to take care of business, Oz might dissolve in an emerald mist. He'd be there as soon as he could. Cat herself could not overcome her habit of punctuality. She tried. It wasn't in her to be late for anything, ever. At LeBlanc, she passed through a moment with the hostess, a new girl, mega smiley in her confusion over what exactly to do with a black woman who'd arrived alone. Before the girl could speak, Kat said, I'm meeting Simon Dryden. I believe we have a reservation. The girl consulted her list. Why, yes, she said. Mr. Dryden isn't here yet. Let's get me seated then, shall we? The queenly bearing and the school marm diction, the smiling ultra-formality. You did what you had to do. Absolutely, the hostess chimed and led Kat to the second booth. As Kat settled in, she locked eyes with Fred. Fred was one of the legion of New York actors who impersonated waiters while they hoped things would break for them. He wasn't young anymore, though. He was becoming what he once pretended to be, a wise-cracking waiter, brusque and charmingly irreverent, knowledgeable about wines. Hello, Fred, Kat said. Hey, said Fred, perfectly cordial, but glassy somehow, caught up short. For Cat, sans Simon, he had no banter strategy. How are you? Oh, good, I'm good. Can I get you a drink? Funny how hard it could be, sitting alone in a restaurant. Funny to be someone who could talk calmly to psychopaths but had trouble being an unescorted woman who made a waiter uncomfortable. She had Fred bring her a vodka on the rocks. She looked at the menu. Cattle fed on bone meal, slaughter of the innocents poison in the walls. Well, now, apparently at moments of stress, she didn't need to write them down anymore. She was on her second drink when Simon arrived. It still shocked her sometimes, seeing him in public. He was so unassailably young and fit. He was a jaguar. He was a goddamned parade float rolling along, demonstrating to ordinary citizens that a gaudier, grander world, a world of potently serene, self-contained beauty, appeared occasionally amid the squalor of ongoing business, that behind the blank gray face of things there existed an inner realm of wealth and ease, of urbane celebration. She watched the hostess check him out. She watched him stride with the confidence of a brigadier general to her table, stunning in his midnight blue suit. It might as well have been spangled with tiny stars and planets. He kissed her on the lips. Yes, people, I'm his date. I'm his girlfriend, okay? Sorry I'm late, he said. Oh, you're fine. Is it crazy at work? You're asking me? Simon frowned compassionately. His brows bristled like a pair of chocolate-colored caterpillars. Cat had an urge to stroke them. Crazy is a relative concept, she said. Hmm. He said, so you think you talk to this guy? Now, Simon was going to be stern and unhysterical, even a little casual in this, his first second-hand crisis. He was going to be someone who could manage the news of a random bomber with the same gra grave suavity she knew he must bring to his business deals. Let's get you a drink, and I'll tell you about it, Kat said. He sat down across from her. Fred came right away. Hey, Fred, Simon said. Hey, homeboy. Fred answered, fluent in man-speak. Heard the news? Simon asked. Scary. You know Cat, right? Absolutely. Hey, Cat. Cat's with the police department. She's working on this one. I live in a world of danger, Fred. I'm deeper inside of things than you can possibly know. You're kidding, Fred said. Cat watched him go through an intricate reassessment. All right, she had a real job, and quite possibly an interesting one. But bottom line, didn't this make her one of those grim black women, the sticklers for protocol who tortured the populace from behind civic counters and post office windows? Not at liberty to discuss it, Kat said. 
Right, right. Fred nodded sagely. He was up to the challenge of playing a waiter who could be trusted with a little inside information. He was more than up to it. <clears throat> Kat said, Simon, why don't you order yourself a drink? Simon paused and said, uh, right, just a glass of wine. Good. Fred nodded again in Kat's direction. Undercover waiter, good in a crisis. He went off to get the wine. What was it with men? Why were they so eager to impersonate someone brave and competent and in the know? Simon, baby, Kat said, you can't say things like that. Not to waiters. Oh, gotcha, sorry. You can't be showing me off to people. Besides, I'm not Foxy Brown. I'm just a grunt, really. It's because I'm proud of you, I know. So what happened? A kid called in with a bomb threat, that's all. And you think it's this kid who blew the guy up? Possibly. The kid must have known the guy, right? She hesitated. She had to give him something, didn't she? He was her boyfriend. And admit it, this was part of what she had to offer him. It would seem that way. Now my guess is it's a sex thing. Odds are we'll get a missing report from somewhere in the vicinity of Dick Hart's neighborhood, and we'll find that he'd been blowing the perpetrator in the backseat of his BMW. Kat knew the word perpetrator would get Simon semi-hard. She promised herself to stop acting extra cop-like to turn him on. <laughs> Screwed that one up. Right, Simon said. His brows bristled. It would have been nice to peel them gently off his face, hold them in her palm, and put them carefully back again. What do you want to eat, she asked. I don't know, the tuna, I guess. Simon was Atkins, high protein, no carbs. And really, consider the results. I'm going to have the steak au poivre, she said, and mashed potatoes. I almost had a very hard day, all right? They went back to her place that night, and never mind about the mess. She was rattled. She realized how much she wanted her own bed. Simon didn't mind her crappy apartment every now and then. He claimed to like it, actually. Although she'd never come out and asked him, it was likely that until he met her, he'd never even been to East Fifth Street. She woke up at 3.30. She didn't have to look at the clock. She knew this abrupt and arid consciousness, this jump from deep dreams to a wakefulness that was not so much having slept enough as having suddenly lost the knack for sleep. On the nights it happened, it always happened between 3.30 and 4. She had a little something for it in the medicine cabinet, but she never even opened the bottle. She seemed to prefer insomnia to simulated sleep. Control thing. Fucked up, really, but what could she do? Simon breathed steadily beside her. She let herself stare at him as he grimaced over a dream. He was a true classic. Big, broad, anchorman face, vigorous thatch of sable-colored hair beginning to be threaded here and there with strands of sterling silver. He could have been fresh off the assembly line of whatever corporation produced the great American beauties. Rich and healthy, 33 years old, practically adolescent in man years. Maybe it was time to quit the unit. He got a little crazy working the nuts. You listened to every lunatic with the same patience. You reminded yourself over and over that any one of these people might really and truly be about to torture grade school or blow up a store or kill somebody just because he was well known. Bartenders must start seeing a world full of drunks. Lawyers must see it as largely made up of the vengefully injured. Forensic psychologists got infected by paranoia. You knew better than the average citizen that the world contains a subworld where the residents do as most people do, pay rent and buy groceries, but have a little something extra going on. They receive personal messages from their television sets, or are raped nightly by a sitcom star, or have discovered that the cracks on the sidewalk between Broadway and Lafayette spell out the names of the aliens who are posing as world leaders. The most surprising thing about these people, as it turned out, was their dullness. All their human juices flowed in one direction. They cared about nothing, really, beyond their fixations. Anyone's sweet old aunt in Baltimore was more vital and various, even if her life was only watching television and clipping discount coupons out of magazines. You sat in your crummy police department office, which resembled nothing so much as a failing mail-order business, and listened to them. You logged them in on your five-year-old computer, you hoped none of them would follow through. You hoped on your worst days, 
no one liked to talk about this, that one of them would. She got out of bed, careful not to wake Simon, and went to the window. Wasn't much of a view, just three floors down onto Fifth Street, but still, here was a slice of the city. Here was the old homeless man chanting in front of the florists. Here were the orange street lights and the brown house fronts, the dark clad pedestrians, the whole smoky, sepia stained semi reality of it. This city at night, the most convincing stage set ever devised. No ocean or mountains, hardly any trees, just street after street bright and noisy under a pink-gray sky pierced by antennas and water tanks. While down below, across the street from Cat's building, a flame-blue sign buzzed, cleaner. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that lovely reading. Before we get to global terrorism. There'll, there'll be some jokes, too. There will, yes. I would <laughs> like to talk there. a bit about Simon first, about a fragment you read to us. Because in my introduction, I was talking about your great sensitivity toward uh, otherness, gay men, women. But here we have Simon. I can't think of anyone who's more he-man than Simon. <laughs> Where did Simon come from? Um, Simon, Simon in, this, in, in that section is, is sort of a mechanical man, really. Um, he is the, you know, I write, I write almost exclusively about crackpots and oddballs and outsiders and, and people who are not not the man on the billboard, not, not the ideal consumer. Um, and I wanted, I, 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 thought, I thought I would write one who was. He is, my, <clears throat> he is my only totally straight white guy to date. <laughs> I don't imagine it'll be my last, but you know, he sort of, he sort of counterbalances the, balances the lizard woman in the third story. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another um, he-man also in Specimen Days, if I might call him that, a he-man poet maybe, Walt Whitman. Ah, oh, Walt, yes, um, yes. Why Walt? You know, um, now I have to say, I, I don't smoke, but because they have actually offered me the possibility of smoking up here, I've started just, just out of, out of, out of, out of <laughs> ex exultation at the possibility. <laughs> um, but I won't light up right now, I'm just having, I just have it ready. Um, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, a really, for a question I don't know how to answer. Um, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to put Walt Whitman in this book, if for no other reason than the fact that I didn't want it to look like I had made a bundle out of Virginia Woolf and was now trying to see if I could squeeze a few bucks out of Walt Whitman. Um, <laughs> But as I did the research for the first part, the ghost story, which is set among very poor, among poor Irish immigrants in the 1860s, um, I learned not only that, that New York, for the poor at that time, was, was a truly terrible place. I mean, I mean, I mean think, think Calcutta. Noisy and polluted and dangerous. People, routine, people worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day. There, there was no trash pickup. If a horse dropped over dead in front of your building, the horse just stayed there, and you walked around it for a very, it takes nature a very long time to dispatch a horse. Um, hmm. And in the middle of all this walked Walt Whitman, our great ecstatic poet, our, the, the, the Rumi of the 19th century, saying, I find it all mysterious and compelling and strange and even beautiful. And I thought, oh, I can't really leave that out, can I? I, I? I put him in, or his poetry in, as a kind of 
undersoul for the book, if you, if you will, as a sort of um, more optimistic voice to show through in the very much darker world I was going to be writing about. There he is, Walt Whitman. You never know where he's going to pop up. Well, talking about that darker world, um, you've mentioned it already in your, uh, in your opening uh, speech here that you wanted to write about global terrorism. Did you feel it was your obligation to write about, an America, about America, about what had happened there? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. Not, not because I feel like I have anything to teach about terrorism, but simply because it, is, it was suddenly and hugely a part of my world, a part of, a part of everybody's world. And, and, and to write about a New York in which 9-11 had not occurred would have felt a little bit like writing about London after, right after World War II and not mentioning that, that business about the bombs. I, I just don't see how you could not. But you decided, as you write in your author's note, to freely juxtapose events, buildings, people. How did you go about this? Because clearly it is not, uh, it's a very different take on 9-11 compared to, for instance, Ian McCune's Saturday. Yeah, yeah. You know, that note is really, refers primarily to the first part in which I mixed, I played a little, I played a little fast and loose with dates. Um, Whitman wasn't really in New York much in 1865. He had pretty much left New York by then. Um, I, there is a fire that's meant to very closely resemble the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, uh, which is a huge thing in America, um, which didn't occur until 1911. Really, I put it in there to try to forestall some of the indignant letters that would, that, that would read, Dear Mr. Cunningham, it's, it's, my, it's my terrible duty to inform you that you have the following things wrong. <laughs> I'm going to get those letters anyway. But was there something you, you, you wanted to tell your readers about these events? Was there uh, a message about American identity, about New York? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 certainly, I certainly have ideas about American identity and, and, and New York. The, the, the thing about um, the acknowledgement that, that I had that the, 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 the dates and the circumstances are not entirely accurate was really more a matter of conscience because I just feel like we are being lied to so constantly by just about everybody. I just want to tell as much truth as I possibly can, even, even, even if it runs to the obsessive. But it's a very bleak truth, if I may say so. What, about, about historical accuracy? Yeah. Mm. Hence, hence the, hence the <laughs> acknowledgement. Don't, don't take this as a history lesson. Or a bleak, bleak, uh, bleak view on, on, on New York. I mean, the end of your book, New York, is really has become a very cynical place. It's turned into an uh, attraction park in which you can become a theme park. Yeah, uh, hire yeah. people to rob you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds so. Gee, it sounds so funny when you say it like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, most science fiction is, is about the darker possibilities. There is very little science fiction that, that, in, that proclaims the arrival of a better world. Um, it, it's generally cautionary in nature, and I don't think my particular future is inevitable, but I did imagine a future in which New York is actually sort of reproduction of itself, meant to be visited by tourists. Um, it's a future in which America is no longer a significant power, but has declined, um, and, and Europe and Asia are, are, the, are the, the powers that, that truly run the world. Much of that America is, is polluted to the point where it's really not livable, and the southern part is run by Christian fundamentalists. <laughs> now, I'm not saying any of that is bound to happen, but I also am not looking around at, at America right now and, and, thinking, and thinking that any of it is categorically impossible. The, the juxtaposing of the three stories, 
Um, I was wondering about it, what you wanted to achieve with it. Uh, achieve with it. We have uh, a line by Walt Whitman coming up all the time saying we are all the same person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What did you want to say? That each time, each age has its own 9-11, has its own disasters, has, has its own Catherine Simons and Lucases? Yeah, I think, I, I think all novels, all the novels I like are to some degree about survival about the, the incredible human capacity to survive the worst that can happen. And I wanted to follow these three characters, though they morph and mutate from story to story, as they survive different difficult times and all come to what, what I consider to be good ends, though I know, it's slightly amb though I know that's slightly ambiguous. Would you call survival one of the main themes in your, in your books in general? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I really think it's one of the main themes in literature. Really? It's, look, what, look what these people got through. Look what these people lived through. Or didn't live through. It's, you know, not, not everyone survives, of course. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 think, I, think it's, I think it's one of our most remarkable qualities as a species, our ability to live through unthinkable horrors. I mean, look at history. And, and yet, there are sonatas, there's poetry. We, we, we haven't just fallen to our knees in anguish. We, we, we live on. And I love that about us. That's, I think that's, that's, that's part of why we make good, good subjects for novels. <laughs> Yeah, I find it interesting what you say about literature as a, as a positive thing in, in life to, to hang on to. Because in the book from the second part where you uh, read from, I will make a long question so you mm -hmm. have the time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's so generous of you. We have uh, Ket, the, the psychologist. I just want to say this is the last time in my life I'm going to get to smoke indoors. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> she uh, receives a call that announces... Uh, a bombing, and, she, and uh, the blow quotes Walt Mid Whitman's poetry, and mm -hmm. she goes to a professor who specializes in uh, Walt Whitman, and uh, asks if this poetry of Walt Whitman can be dangerous, mm -hmm. because this guy who is about to blow, uh, blow up buildings is uh, quoting him, and uh, the professor says, why did Chapman choose Salinger? And Chapman is, uh, is the one who, uh, who killed John Lennon and had a copy of... Uh, Catcher in the Rye on him. Well, I'd say it was to feed his own narcissistic sense of himself as a sensitive loner. He identified with Holden Caulfield, Cat answers. Um, here you have a more pessimistic view on literature. I mean, it could, it can people make people kill, actually. Walt Whitman's poetry is something to... Maybe we shouldn't be reading it all day. <laughs> that, yeah, that you stop reading Walt Whitman. It's just some terrible things <laughs> in the world. Uh, you know, I think, I think any powerful force, whether it's great art, science, religion, any powerful force can be used any number of ways, for good or for ill. Look at what people justify in the name of the Bible or the Koran. Look at the splitting of the atom. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it was a really good discovery, and yet, and yet, and yet. And I think, it, it, I think of it as a measure of my respect for poetry, that, that it, can be, it can be misinterpreted. It can be, if, if, it, if, it's just, if it's just pretty, if it's just to console us in, in, our, in our times of need, and, and, and it's not potent enough to be used by evil people to evil ends, then I don't want any part of it. It's not a big enough thing. Um, well, literature can also be a lifesaver. It is a lifesaver for uh, Laura Brown, who reads uh, Mrs. Dalloway in The Hours. And we have a fragment from The Hours. We, uh, would you mind if we take a look at it? I'd be happy to. Okay. Roll them. Breakfast is served between 7 and 11 in the Regency Room, and room service is available 24 hours. Thank you, ma'am. 
Is there anything else you need? Yes. Um, no. Not to be disturbed. Did it matter then, she asked herself, walking toward Bond Street? Did it matter that she must inevitably cease completely? All this must go on without her. Did she resent it? Or did it not become consoling to believe that death ended absolutely? It is possible to die. is possible to die. There was a lovely coat for Angelica at Harrods, then nothing for the boys. It seems so unfair. Why should Angelica have you favoured? Virginia. Virginia. Virginia! What are you thinking about? with us. Your aunt's a very lucky woman, Angelica. Because she has two lives. She has the life she's leading and also the book she's writing. This makes her very fortunate indeed. What were you thinking about? I'm very curious, uh, Michael, to hear how you experienced uh, the, the way your book was displayed on the screen. Were you content with it? I was thrilled by it. Um, I was especially thrilled that it had its own identity. It had its own rhythm, its own look. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't have that sort of half-life that adaptations so often have. It was, it was a... a a thing unto itself. Were you involved uh, with the making of the movie? I was, I was, and it, this was kind of interesting. Um, as, as David Hare was working on the script, he was much more reverent toward the book than I was. We would talk about a draft and, and, and he would say, well, I don't, I, I don't know what to do with this part. And I would say, I know, you should probably just cut it. He said, no, but it's, it's from the book. And I said, oh. <laughs> I wrote that on a Tuesday with a hangover. You can get rid of that. 
I think in many ways a writer might be the best qualified to, 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 to help adapt his novel because he may, he, may, he may feel the least sort of nervous about it. I know that any book is just one, it's just one possible book out of the many you could have written and you always wish it might have been different. And if you're lucky enough to have a beautiful movie made out of your book, you get to see it as if it had been different. Was it the book you wrote that you saw? Uh, yes and no. It's another version of the book I wrote. You know, you know writers um, sometimes go on about how they are afraid that Hollywood will, will mess up their, their books, or, or I hate it when people say that they're babies. It's not your baby, it's a book you wrote. <laughs> um, and I feel like, again, any novel is simply the best novel you could write at that moment in your life. Five years later, five months later, you would write it differently. And if somebody of great integrity, like David Hare, the writer, and Stephen Daldry, the director, comes along and says, we want to take this story and convert it into some other form, like a movie, the only reasonable reaction I can think of is to say, great, go see what you can do with it. Surprise me. Please don't be faithful, because we've already got the book. Take it somewhere else. Do something that I wouldn't have thought of. The amazing thing is that Virginia Woolf herself, in her essay, The Cinema, she was very um, pessimistic about uh, making movies out of books. She, she uses the example of Anna Karenina. She says it doesn't work. Well, she could be very cranky about so many things. <laughs> <laughs> But she's a hero of yours, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, love, I love her in her crankiness. I, this is just a, just a sort of quick behind-the-scenes movie. The, the, only, um, the only disagreement David and I had um, actually concerned the scene we just saw with Julianne Moore. Um, David had her taking a gun to the hotel with her. And I said, David, this family wouldn't have a gun. And if you want to try to invent some reason for them, for them to have a gun, there's, there's, there's an escaped convict on the loose. They have to arm themselves. <laughs> um, she still wouldn't do that. She wouldn't make that kind of mess. She wouldn't do it to herself. And David said, well, I know that's the stereotype. Chekhov said that, that, that men kill themselves by violence, women kill themselves with pills. I want to upset the stereotype, and all, which was all very reasonable. But I, as I listened to him, I thought, no. David Hare, English person. <laughs> you just think all Americans are packing, don't you? <laughs> And I'll bet you think, if, if, if this argument goes on much longer, I'm going to take out my gun and shoot you, don't you? <laughs> Amazing thing is also there's a pregnant woman smoking uh, in the film. I know. There my was mother, a lot of fuss about it. I know, I know. It's the 50s. My mother, my mother smoked, I think, in the delivery room. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free if you... Thank you. Thank you. I'm not pregnant, mm. as far as I know. Um, amazing in this fragment is also that Laura Brown actually decides she wants to live after reading Mrs. Dalloway. Is this um, something that you recognize? Has literature ever had, has had such an influence on your personal life, where it actually influenced your behavior? Um, oh, sure. Oh, sure. I mean, nothing, nothing quite as focused and dramatic as, as, as what happened to Laura Brown, but Yeah, it changed my life. If, 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 it, if, if I didn't feel that way about it, I don't think I would spend my life trying to do it. But yeah, beginning early, when I started to read serious books, I felt a kind of company in the world that, that has never And who were your companions? Me. Um, Well, some sort of low characters, like Emma Bovary, who was a terrible <laughs> person, um, and, and Raskolnikov and Anna Karenina. There was a moment in college when I was reading Leaves of Grass, Whitman's singular poem. Um, and I should be able to quote it, but I have no memory. Um, there's a passage that goes something like this, reader, Wherever you are, 
know that as I write these lines, I am as alive and present in my world as you will be in your world, even though I may be gone and my world may be gone. Where are you? Is it night? Are you alone? Is the lamp lit? And it was, and I was, and it was. And I, and I Walt, get back. And it, I, 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 had, I, I had my first sense of, of, of how literature, great literature can, act, can actually collapse time. And I actually fully understood that Walt Whitman had been alive, as had everyone who is now no longer alive. Yeah. How about the influence of your own books? I mean, do you ever get letters saying, Dear Michael, I've read the hours. Will leave my husband immediately? Or? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I do get letters that are probably the most unambivalent pleasure connected with, with, with publishing books. Every, everything else is, 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 is complicated. You know, it's great to win a big prize, but you look at all the other books that have won the same prize and go, I don't know. Um, and much, you know, and, and, and it's easy to feel like you're just getting away with something, people have low standards, or, um, but then you get letters from people who have been moved by the book, and that, that means everything. Um, and I did get It means more than winning the Pulitzer Prize, for instance. Um, well, I'm afraid I'm going to try to, like, I'll, I'll sound like I'm trying to be some sort of grotesquely lovely person if I say, well, yes, <laughs> I care nothing for prizes. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's say it's a simpler and more, and more direct satisfaction, the knowledge that a book connects. And I got a surprising number of letters. I think this probably happens whenever you put any story out into the world. I got a surprising number of letters from women who, who, whose lives had been exactly Laura Brown's, who had reached the point where they just couldn't go on, and they left their husbands, and they, then they did the unthinkable, the supposedly unforgivable, they left their children because they had to. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think one of the things that we look to in, in literature is the notion that there is nothing we, there's nothing we're capable of doing that's unforgivable. I'm done. You go. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm chewing on it. Now, you've uh, also, another book of yours was made into a motion picture. Home at the End of the World. The world. Mm -hmm. um, has it influenced your writing, knowing that you are a writer that is really um, well adaptable for the widescreen? You know, I am as, I'm determined to be as uninfluenced by the possibility of a film adaptation as I possibly can be. I think once you start to think of a novel as some sort of midway point toward its true destination as a movie, you're in big trouble. So one of my thoughts as I was writing Specimen Days is nobody's gonna wanna make this, this baby into a movie. I mean, it's in these genres, okay, but, it, but, but it's sprawling and, and, and it would involve expensive special effects and um, I and have there, has there been, have there been nothing? Well, then of course, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott Rudin, the man who produced the hours, optioned Specimen Days. But this is why we love Scott Rudin. Um, after he optioned the book, I went and sat with him, sat with him in his office. I, I got to know him pretty well when we were shooting the hours. Um, I said, you know, uh, it's hard to see what, how to make this into a movie, but maybe if you don't mind, we could just take one part of it and make it into a movie. Or, or, or you know, maybe we could get three different directors to each do, it, do a section and show it on television. Or maybe Philip Glass would like to do it as an opera. <laughs> now, there are probably any number of Hollywood producers who would option your book thinking it might make a good opera. But Scott's the only one I've met. <laughs> Would you like it to? Uh, I would love that. Be staged as an opera. Yeah. More than that, I think I love the idea that 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 somebody like Scott is open to, to all the possibilities. You know, one of my fa <laughs> flesh and blood. Um, three novels ago, I learned was was made entirely illegally 
into a multi-episode soap opera shown on the internet in Brazil. <laughs> I was so thrilled. <laughs> I'd only, I only wish I could have seen it. Well, it should be possible. It's digital, eh? I'm sure I could, yeah, I could yeah. probably find it, yeah. Someone will start looking for you immediately. Yeah, if anyone out there knows about it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, I think it's time for questions from the audience. Is there anyone who would like to ask Michael Cunningham a question? There are microphones everywhere, one everywhere. over there, one over there. Feel free to ask him anything, his favorite color. <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> I'll answer any question no matter how humiliating. <laughs> I could ask you questions. <laughs> I, have a lot, I have a lot of them. Could, could you please go up to the microphone if you don't mind? Hello. Um, Hello. First of all, thank you for your novels. I've read the hours and I'm almost at the end of the specimen days and it's beautiful. It's thank really you. poetry. Thank you. And I'm curious about the writing process. If you could just Mm. Tell a bit about that. You know, I can certainly tell you that every writer has his or her own way of, of writing. And that every writer I know, myself included, suspects that we're doing it wrong. And that if we did it in some other way, our books would turn out better. Um, the trick, if you're, if you're trying to write or thinking of writing, is to find, find the way that you work best. Um, for me, you mean the day-to-day -day process. Um, the only thing that's really important to me is that I wake up and get right to work so that I segue from sleep and dreams directly into the writing so, so that I kind of maintain a delusion, if you will, about the realness of the story that I'm making up. I've learned that if I do errands on my way. I have a studio, it's about a 15 minute walk from where we live in New York. And um, I've learned that if I even, even, if I even just stop to sort of like drop off the dry cleaning or, or, or pick up something at the drugstore, I get to my studio and I look at what I wrote yesterday and I think, well, I'm just making this up. <laughs> this isn't as profound and mysterious as a drugstore. This, this isn't as utterly real and fabulous as the dry cleaners. Um, but I go, I sit for at least three or four hours every day as anyone who, has, who writes knows there are the good days and there are the bad days. Um, and I have found that on the bad days, I still, if I still sit there and crank out even one lame sentence, which I promise to delete tomorrow. Um, a few months later, I can't tell what I wrote on the good days when I felt just invincible from what I wrote on the bad days when I felt like a fraud and a hack, which leads me to suspect that there is always something floating, floating up from the magma through the floorboards, and what varies is our availability to it. And so part, the big part of the trick for me is to just sit there and sit there and sit there and wait for the, cha the channels to open up, if you will. That's not too horribly new age. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. I know that guy. He's actually teaching a Michael Cunningham class. No. <laughs> yes, no. <really. laughs> Hi there. Um, we're actually here with a whole class, maybe uh, do a little bit. Hello. <laughs> I was just curious if you could say something about um, how the idea for the hour started. Did you, um, did you have that idea when you were reading Mrs. Dalloway, or was it an idea about Laura Brown, or how did, it, how did that emerge, and perhaps also for specimen days? Does it start with a line from Whitman, for instance? You know, it varies from book to book, but, but mostly what I start with is, is a sort of silly idea, which then, in the writing, I hope the book will sort of overcome mm -hmm. and, and become something, something else. 
All I meant to do originally in the hours was to write a contemporary version of Mrs. Dalloway. I was going to set it in the present in New York City, and I was going to write about a 52-year-old gay man, because I, as a gay man living in New York City, find that certain, el certain segments of white gay male society are disturbingly like London in the 20s, <laughs> <laughs> with a similar hierarchy and materialism and, and, and awful politics. Um, and that quickly revealed itself to be a sort of insufficient idea, and really, who wants to, who wants to read a new version of Mrs. Dalloway? We've got Mrs. Dalloway. And gradually, over time, um, it, it developed into, into what it became. But, it, but it, it, went, it went through many stages. I, I decided that it was really needed to be about women, that it was deeply about women, and I just couldn't transpose it to a man's life. Um, I, I toyed with the idea of writing a day in the life of a contemporary Mrs. Dalloway on the right-hand pages and a day in the life of Virginia Woolf as she was trying to write Mrs. Dalloway on the left-hand pages, so, you, so they kind of kiss as you, as you turn the pages. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't coming, and it wasn't coming, and it was finally when I added the third character, Laura Brown, who was initially meant very directly to be my mother, though, though she mutated somewhat in the writing, that suddenly it sort of fell into place as this kind of triptych. Right. Um, and so the, the, the gay man was, was Richard, and that you had like a vision um, of him? No, the gay, well, sort of, sort of, in a very sort of distant way. I, 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 um, I played around with that too. I, I wasn't sure whether, whether to make that figure a sort of magisterial older woman, more like Virginia Woolf. And I finally thought, no, no, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a gay man who, 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 has, who has AIDS, which is a sort of allusion to Septimus Warren Smith in Mrs. In Mrs. Dalloway, who is a sort of shell-shocked veteran of world, of world War I. Richard is essentially a shell-shocked veteran of the AIDS epidemic. Great. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Keep on writing. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Other questions? Yep. I have another question up here. Yes. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to see up there. There you Hey. Um, do you still, I wonder, do you still read yourself? And if so, what contemporary authors do you admire? Oh, great, thank you. I'm very, always very happy to mention my favorite contemporary authors. I, I do read, constantly. You know, I, 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 um, well, no, you, you, I, hear, I hear other writers say things like, when I'm writing, I, I try not to read great books because I'm afraid of being influenced. And my feeling about that is always, well, darling, if you're nervous about turning into Faulkner or Garcia Marquez, <laughs> rest easy. You will come through the experience unharmed. <laughs> um, I, I, I try to be as influenced as I can by books and movies and television and silly magazines and, and pop songs, you know, the white stripes and the killers are, are part of what's, what, what's all coming in and, and sort of somehow feeding what I'm doing. Um, some of my favorite contemporary writers are, um, well, there's an English writer, Jim Crace, who I'm really, really nuts about. Um, I love Ishiguru. Um, Hilary Mandel, the smartest, meanest living human being. Um, how could I be blanking on this person's name? Um, Japanese writer, Norwegian Wood, and um, the Painted Bird Chronicles. Thank, uh, what, Murakami, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for helping your poor old ailing uncle. Um, <laughs> There's a fantastic, under-recognized American writer named Joanna Scott, 
who I, I urge everyone to read. Um, there is a young African-American writer named Victor Laval, who I think is amazing. Um, ben Marcus. There's a lot out there right now. I, 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 feel, I feel like we're in a, a kind of very, very fertile literary period. And there's always 10 books stacked up on my, on my desk. And I'm always despair of, of, of getting to them all. Other questions? Yeah, I have, I have a question about the, uh, the middle section of specimen books. Could you mm -hmm. walk up to the microphone, please? I have a question about the middle section of specimen days, in which you make Walt Whitman um, in a character of a woman. Um, I didn't, it didn't click with me, so mm -hmm. can you explain, maybe? Yeah, what's, what's that about? Um, <laughs> You know, because the, because the three main characters were going to mutate from story to story, I thought, I thought Walt Whitman should mutate too. He is, he is variously himself in the first story, um, a, very, a very strange and, and deluded, though quite articulate woman in the second story, and a black scientist in the, in, in the third story. Um, by which I suppose to say, in, in, my, in my way, that we're all Walt Whitman. We're all, we all have, and not just Walt Whitman, we're all Keats and Yeats and, and, and any, any artist who, who feeds us. Um, the body is immaterial. What matters is this, sort of, this kind of course of the poetry that runs through the race, that runs through the species. It felt like more. It felt, and it felt like more fun than just have old Walt with a, with his beard and his hat pop up over and over again. <laughs>